All right, it's a great honor today to have with us Joseph Flynn, the youngest brother of General Michael Flynn, who if you have, unless you've been under a rock, you know all about <laughs> General Michael Flynn and the Trump administration and the deep state and the efforts to unseat the president and all of that. How are you doing, Joe? Good to have you with us. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Really good to have you. It's very good for you to be here. Let's, let's go straight into the information first sure. about your brother. Uh, the latest information that's come out, you were saying you got a phone call and you're like, what? Yeah. There's even yeah. more stuff now? <laughs> you just take yeah, us away. Yeah. Tell us the story. Yeah, le le yesterday afternoon, General Flynn called me. I'm, in addition, obviously, to being his brother, I'm, I've been very close with him on this case because I run the legal defense fund with my sister. And so we work, we kind of work as a team and with Sydney and her team. And uh, Michael called me yesterday uh, and said, uh, are you sitting down? And I said, yeah. He goes, well, there's more uh, texts and emails and information coming out that has been withheld from us. It's very damning to the FBI and to the, and to the Department of Justice, the fact that we're, you know, they didn't hand this in to us on the May the 7th when they dropped the charges, you know, makes, them even look, makes it even look worse. You know, there's basically, Things like uh, you know, agents talking to each other about getting themselves insurance policies should there be an IG report. Yeah. Because there was no evidence here of a crime against General Flynn. It's as clear as day. Okay. And then secondly, last night around midnight, <clears throat> the the uh, DOJ dropped a 302 interview with one of the FBI agents that was on General Flynn's case. And essentially, it, it, that interview took place September of uh, this year, September uh, a few months, a few weeks ago, a few days ago. And basically that, this, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but the agent basically talked about how this was a setup from the very top and that there was never a case against Flynn. They were considering dropping any investigation as far back as November of 2016, but they kept it open, they kept it open, particularly after the election and, and use that leaked conversation with uh, the Russian ambassador, which was perfectly uh, normal and perfectly regular to g gin up charges. And, and really, and it says it very clearly, the agents, the lower level agents were concerned. The only reason that the White House was directing this was to go after Trump. Right. It's unbelievably damning. Uh, none of the mainstream media have picked it up at all. They're, they're dead silent yeah. today about it. I, I've been monitoring that a little bit. Fox has covered it a little bit, but yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Is there a, uh, I mean, what do you think's really going on here? I mean, is this just, uh, I mean, it seems to me the, the, the more information that comes out about this, the less and less likely it is that Obama personally did not have his fingerprints all over this. You can't just have your <laughs> highest level, your highest level cabinet position all doing something, you know, the members of your cabinet, you know, the attorney general, et cetera, all doing all this stuff and you're just the president, you have no idea what's going on. It just seems weird. Well, there's no question. The evidence, particularly the, uh, the the 302 that just came out that they dropped last night with this agent, is very clear that this was all being directed by the White House. and By Obama's White we, House. By Obama's White House. And as we know, there was a meeting that took place, I think it was January the 4th or 5th, where Obama, Comey, um, uh, Joe Biden, Sally Yates, and Andy McCabe, and I think Peter Strzok were all in the White House talking to uh, Susan Rice, talking about how are we going to go after Flynn? You know, should we use the Logan Act? Joe Biden comes up and says, you know, should we use the Logan Act? This is all evidence has come forth since then. This is all being suppressed by the media right now. I right. mean, if this was the other way around, if it was the Trump administration doing these kind of nefarious things, I guarantee you it would be splashed on the New York Times. It would be on the cryons all over the, all over the world uh, about how the Trump administration spying on their political enemies. I mean, it's unbelievable. And it's no, and it's clear evidence here that uh, I believe Obama and Biden were, were deeply involved in this. And that they thought they could get to Flynn to get to Trump. The, the ultimate goal was to get, you know, to get the president, 25th Amendment. I mean, they, they were throwing everything in the kitchen sink. At this. Yeah, do you think there is a, uh, uh, well, I, I'm sure I know the answer to this, but uh, I, I my, Deeper question is, how extensive do you think the so-called deep state is, the effort to simply, you know, submarine Trump, heck, even before the inauguration, even before the election, uh, how extensive do you think that, uh, that has been, that effort, even up to yeah, today? Yeah, I, I think the Obama administration 
in an eight year period did everything they could to fill the, the fill the jobs in the intelligence community and the Justice Department with as many very loyal sycophants as they possibly could in order to because really what they, they never thought that Trump was going to win. They thought that Hil the Hillary uh, Clinton administration would be a continuation of Obama's policies, which was taking us on a march towards socialism uh, and maybe even Marxism. There, there was a lot that they had planned, which we're seeing now manifesting itself in a more violent kind of way right now. I think they, if Hillary had won, they could have done it softly. Now they're trying to do it very hardly. But uh, you can call it deep state and call it what you want. What what Obama did, what the Obama administration did in infiltrating our intelligence community uh, with political activists and our Justice Department with political activists, as we're seeing, is extremely damaging to this country. And you know they didn't expect a Donald Trump win. Okay, <laughs> uh, we, we, a, a book came out recently by a good friend of ours by the name of Lee Smith, and it's called Permanent Coup. This is a permanent coup. The coup started before the election and is continuing today. Uh, it, there's, they, they haven't stopped with their intention of bringing down the presidency. So yeah, I think there's a deep state. I think that um, many many on the establishment Republican Party are guilty of being part of this deep state as well. Uh, you you know they, they they weren't expecting, nor did they want to support an outside presidential candidate like Donald Trump, who came out of the blue with zero experience in Washington. I mean, he said it himself. He traveled to Washington only a few times prior to uh, building his hotel down. Right. It's not a place where he spent a lot of time and, and he criticized it. So, you know, this was, a, this was a blow to the deep state. This was a blow to the political establishment that has really permeated Washington. And, and it's just amazing to watch it unfold. Yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people really appreciate uh, just how corrupt uh, the government had become under Obama uh, right. and that they could have all of these mechanisms in place. Uh, and, you know, that I, I'm not even sure Trump himself realized the, the depth, if you want to call it that, of the swamp that he actually yeah. walked into. I mean, you're right. I think it's a very key point. I'd like you to elaborate on it that, you know, virtually the entire Democratic Party is a part of that swamp and a pretty large portion of the Republican Party as well, certainly the leadership. We're talking about leaders here in D.C. We're not talking about rank and file out in Iowa. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I, elaborate that on a little bit because, uh, yeah. you know, because your brother, General Michael Flynn, and of course the president have, you know, they've been in the crosshairs of this group now for, you know, almost five years, really. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm a life. I we were, we come from a democratic family. We were Democrats for most of our lives. You know, being from the Northeast, Irish Catholics, we were Kennedy Democrats, pro-life Democrats. So we didn't really have an affinity with the Republican Party. My brother, when was when he was chosen on the on the short list for vice president, was still a registered Democrat, believe it or not. And, and um, uh, I left the party many years ago, about well, ten years ago or so, but. I was ne we were never affiliated or necessarily in love with the Republican establishment who brought us the Iraq war, which we know was a complete disaster. So the whole neocon uh, national security establishment has been a unmitigated disaster for this country and has caused us terrible problems, loss of life and uh, endless wars. And, you know, when Trump came in, he, they knew he was and, and my brother, who was also, you know, had a military background and fought in these endless wars, they knew that they were going to come in and upend the systems, particularly the national security apparatus, which had been sort of this, talk about a deep state, sort of a government within a government, and and had, had amassed an enormous amount of uh, power, uh, where you know th things like you know the CIA, you know, for the last several decades has never had a disclosed budget. Now, how much money are they spending? What are they spending it on? Everything's classified, everything's a secret. Well, these were things that particularly General Flynn was gonna go after and was gonna go after hard. And that was anathema to that sort of establishment. And I think what we've experienced in this country for the last several decades, perhaps since the Kennedy administration is sort of a uniparty uh, where you know there was a period of time up until now that it was hard to distinguish between 
uh, Democrats and Republicans in certain areas, especially in national security issues. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump comes in with a completely different agenda, much of it influenced by his relationship with General Flynn. Right. So these guys were immediately going to be targets to the establishment on both sides of the aisle. Talk to us for a little bit about uh, what you would see as a parallel track of the deep state and the deep, what we've termed here, the deep church, that there's this sort of same synergy going on, you know, independently, but also there's a lot of crossover. Uh, uh, you know, Archbishop Vigano has certainly talked about it. I mean, he didn't call it the deep church, but that's the only term he didn't use. Uh, about sort of, again, this kind of internal corruption, this keeping business as usual, not fulfilling your actual mission. Uh, talk to us a little bit about your, your views on the parallel between the, the state and the church in this area of corruption. Well, one of the beautiful things that have come out of this, uh, this terrible kind of nightmare our family's been through is we've actually been able to establish a, a pretty nice friendship with, with Archbishop Vigano. We were in, we're in touch with him pretty regularly. He's, been a very inspirational spiritual guide for us good and and we appreciate his friendship and his and his love and i pray we pray for him often because we worry about him um i think cardinal vigano hits hits it on the head and i think the rise of the of the pope francis papacy is also something that sort of you know as catholics it sort of came out of the blue we're oh you know pope benedict's retiring what what's that that's never happened what well, hasn't happened in I don't know how many centuries. Right. Uh, all of a sudden, the doctrinal uh, orthodoxy of Benedict kind of gets sidelined by, you know, by Pope Francis, and 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 let's just let's just call a spade a spade, and kind of the liberation theology movement uh, coming out of South America in the 80s, uh, in the 70s and 80s, which has really permeated the the, the Latin American church for sure. But certainly, the, you know, certain orders like the Jesuits, and of course, uh, Bergoglio comes out of that ilk, mm -hmm. um, and and the doctrinaires, kind of get the doctrinaires, more along the lines of, of John Paul II, are getting sidelined more and more, Vigano being one, Vigano being one of them, and the deals that are being done between the Vatican. I mean, we're the only, you know, we're the only religion which has its own state. I mean, which is pretty amazing. When you yeah. think about and, 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 you know, the deals that are being done between the Vatican as a state and certain nefarious uh, uh, other governments like the Chinese are something that are really disturbing and should be very disturbing to Catholics. And I think Cardinal Vigano, when he was uh, Papa Nuncio, really dived, dove into that and was very concerned about this. Uh, as as uh, when you look at, you know, uh, the... Cardinal McCarrick's time in yeah. Washington, how incredibly powerful and influential he was, and kind of the, the side deals that he was cutting with um, with uh, with the Chinese, right. and and the lack of denunciation of Marxism, uh, the over uh, emphasis on this sort of climate change stuff, the lack of um, condemnation of uh, torture and 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 murder of Christians in the Middle East, I mean. Why? Where is the moral leadership in the church right now? We're not seeing it, and I think it's because it's been taken over by a bunch of globalists. I mean, I hate to say it. Well, uh, I mean, I, certainly, I mean, that's what you know. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo essentially said, you know, told the Pope, <laughs> you know, in in Rome, uh, you know, a few days back, uh, you know, what's going on here, guys? You know, right. exactly what you just said. Where? You, why aren't you stepping up? I mean, this is a murderous, torturous, Marxist, uh, you know, concentration camp. Uh, you know, uh, a government and, you know, yeah, just absolutely. shifts millions Perfect. of people in and you don't care. You're, well, how can you sit silent in the face of all of this? And yeah, I mean, I think there's money and unfortunately there's money involved in this. Mm -hmm. what we're seeing, you know, there's reports about the Vatican basically being bought off. Right. By the Chinese. I hate, I hate to say it breaks my heart to say this. Because, you betcha. You, you know, betcha it does. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a lifelong Catholic and come from a very uh, long line of, you know, lifelong Catholics. Uh, you know, we we love the church; it's a big part of our lives. But something desperately bad happened over the last 20, 30 years. Yeah. Since John Paul II uh, moved on, where you had the Pope being a champion against Marxism and totalitarianism under John Paul II, 
And now we have a pope who essentially embraced, embraces many elements of it. Yeah. And it's very soft on issues like uh, pro-life and, and, and the importance of the nuclear family. I mean, it's, 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 it's really sad and really, really heartbreaking. Yeah. And let's face it, we've, we, as Catholics, we've, this is like another blow to us. I mean, over the course of the last 30 years with the, you know, with the, the sex scandal, it's just, it's just been devastating uh, to us as a community. And it's, and it's, uh, I, I tip my hat off to those of our brothers and sisters who have stayed steady in the church and remained uh, Catholics and not left, as you know well, in one of the largest denomin Christian denominations in this country is, is, is former Catholics. Yeah, it's a, that's okay. a, what, a, what, a, what a, that one statement right there, that one stat, what a condemnation that is of the U.S. hierarchy. That that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. This is not because these people weren't, aren't faithful Christians and, and doctrinarily tied to Catholic faith, which is, which is the thing that kind of keeps us together is our doctrine right. and our tradition and our deep understanding of, of the Bible. Okay. The, ch the church hierarchy, in my opinion, is 100% to blame for what has happened to this, to, to our, to our beloved church. And, um, institutionally, uh, it's almost time. And I hate to use the word, but it's almost time for some type of reformation not necessarily of the doctrine, but of the institution. Yeah, it does. I, I, I think you are speaking uh, words that many, probably millions of, of certainly U.S. Catholics, uh, a large number would agree, yeah, there is something rotten in Denmark and it needs to be fixed. And, it really uh, is. And we saw this recently with Father Altman. And many, I'm sure many of your viewers sure. were fathering Father Altman, who, you know, who wasn't doing anything to draw attention to himself. Because, I mean, it actually Father Altman became famous because of COVID, because, right. you know, most of our masses are being done now virtually. <clears throat> so Father Altman's sermons are out there and people right. are seeing it. And they're going, this guy's correct. This guy's 100 percent right what he's right. saying. This guy is speaking my language. And of course, as soon as he starts to get popular and people start to follow him and start to empathize with what he's saying and want to interact with him and, and want to see those changes, that he's calling for, they silence him. Boom, down comes the hammer. That's down right. Down comes the hammer. They never bring a hammer down on James Martin. They never bring, never, they James, never bring James a hammer. James Martin. Yep. Exactly. It, yeah. it, 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 it is amazing. It is amazing to me that we have Father Altman. I was thinking about this in anticipation of this interview. Here we have Father Altman vociferously condemning uh, socialism and Marxism and, and the Black Lives Matter movement, which is does which does nothing good for the African American community in this right. country has done nothing good for the African American community. They burned down their businesses and neighborhoods. <laughs> burned down their businesses and neighborhoods, sowing hatred across a, a nation that had been in a deep healing process, a, a, a racial healing process over the course of the last 20, 30 years. I saw that with my own children. You know, our generation of children, they don't, see, they never even saw color. Right. And, and I thought that was a beautiful thing happening. Absolutely. To, to our generation. Here's Altman railing against it and and Pope Francis being okay with clergy members in places like Nicaragua and others who are ha who are in, who are essentially government officials of Marxist governments I mean this is this is where we talk about a, a, a deep church yeah something's radically wrong with the church if that's allowed to happen yeah at least another hierarchy. another thing that seems to be interesting I'd like your thoughts on is that you know it's while all of this may have sort of sprung into uh, the light of day uh, with you know Pope Francis and you know, all this sort of globalism push, Marxism, socialism, blah blah. <clears throat> clearly, you don't just appear out of nowhere. I'm not talking about the Pope. I'm talking about the yeah. movement within the church. Oh yeah. So then you're left to consider as a faithful Catholic. You're left to consider. Well, wait a second. I mean, immediately before Pope Francis was Pope Benedict. And then, of course, immediately before him was almost 30 years, not quite, of Pope mm -hmm. St. John Paul. Right. So while those guys, as you were saying, both of them were you know, preaching the truth and this and that and everything, mm -hmm. there must have been huge underground work going on at the Vatican 
So, you know, again, if you want to think of it in terms of invading the Justice Department <laughs> and the yeah. national intelligence community right. here in the U.S., that same type of activity had to have been going on and Benedict and, and Pope John Paul just missed it or they you know, weren't informed or whatever. I mean, however that came about. Uh, and I'd, yeah. I'd, I'd like your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with you. It can't just, you know, appear out of nowhere. I, I was a student. I, I graduated from the Catholic University of America in 1987 and have been tied to the university. It's my alma mater. And I think actually of all of uh, the institutions in this country, they've done a pretty good job uh, pre being doctrinally, doctrinally sound. My point is when I was there in the 80s, I could start to see the fissures, the promotion of liberation theology, kind of the fissures between the various orders, the arrival of a lot of kind of open homosexuality, you know, that that, you know, again, I'm, it's not a, uh, I have my own views about homosexuality, nothing against any of it, but as a church, this, these issues were kind of bubbling up at the surface. Uh, right. And, and I, I had a feeling when I graduated that this was, this was, uh, this was going to be a problem. Uh, this was going to be a bigger issue down the road than it was then. Now, at the time, John Paul, St. John Paul II was in full swing in the 80s and, you know, sure, he was, he was just about ready to bring down communism and he uh, was yeah. bringing down communism. Yeah. The, world, the, the Berlin Wall hadn't fallen or anything, but that rise of liberation theology, especially amongst the younger clergy in, in, in let's say, in the Americas, not just South America and Central America, but in the United States. Yeah, well, absolutely. Here in the U.S. was really bubbling to the surface then. And a lot of us were a lot of people were buying it, buying off on it. Saying, oh, this is good. This is social justice, and and you know, but you know, I always kind of had a problem with Jesus as a Marxist. You know, I mean, I didn't get that. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, it, all you had to kind of do is look at Marxist governments and say, I don't think, I don't think uh, the Lord would be okay with what. Yeah, I, I don't think Jesus sets up concentration camps and no, destroys no. families or tortures their political opponents. Right, right. You know, and so and so, but again, my point is, is. That, this was all coming, in my personal opinion, most of it was coming out of the Americas. Yeah. Because if you look at the African church under leaders like uh, Cardinal Arinze down there in Nigeria, the African church is very doctrinal, mm -hmm. very uh, more along the lines of, you know, uh, of Pope Benedict and, and that sort of uh, line of thinking uh, uh, theologically. The Latin, and the, the Latin and the U.S. church have a lot of issues, and I think that influence has really has really been big in the Vatican. Yeah, um, it's, yeah, it's it's been there. It's been there quite a while. It, it, it's clear to us now, like it's clear to us on the political side of things, that all of this stuff was going on off stage, behind the scenes, under the radar, uh, you know, in the church and the federal government, U.S. federal government, and now they've just sort of all emerged at the same time, and isn't it funny that the <laughs> the focal point of all of this is a former New York City billionaire playboy. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. I mean, <laughs> I mean, go ahead. talk about God, to, God full of surprises. <laughs> who's married to a Catholic? Yep. You know, and I think he understands Catholics well. He has a real strong relationship with uh, Cardinal Dolan, and I, I think that's great. Um, but it is interesting that the vessel that is being that that the vehicle to blow up the deep state. So to speak, is a is a multi billionaire, three time married, uh, you know, uh, real estate mogul from New York, you know, brash uh, and in your face kind of guy. I I I, I always kind of use the analogy that Trump is like a wrecking ball. Yeah. You know, he's a just a giant wrecking ball smashing the norms, and people don't like it. They want to, you know, the 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 establishment doesn't like it at all. They hate it. I, it, it was interesting. I, I had an argument with a, a liberal uh, journalist friend of mine, you know, about uh, the re recently when uh, you know, this journalist asked Trump if he's, he's going to be okay, is he going to do anything about the peaceful transition of power? And and Trump answered, well, we have to see what happens with the ballots and so forth. Where, you know, two months ago, Hillary Clinton was talking about how Joe Biden shouldn't concede under any do circumstances. Do not concede yet. <laughs> right. And, 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 Talk about a peaceful transition of power going back to my brother's situation and the president. 
There hasn't been a tr peaceful transition of power since the since the election in 2016. Right. It's been a non-peaceful transition of power. It's been a hostile transition of power. They are doing. They have done everything they possibly can to get the man out of office before his term. Sure. And so this is the first time in American history since the Civil War that we haven't had. A, transition, uh, a peaceful transition of power. Yeah. We don't have one right now. Forget about what happens after November the 3rd. Right. Yeah, that's a very good observation about uh, a four-year uh, non-peaceful transition of power. That's a, that's a very good observation. I recommend this, this book by Lee Smith. It's called The Permanent Coup. I recommend it to your readers. I think it's really important that they read it. It gives the details of this. Excellent. Okay, so one last question. What's up next now for your brother? Well, we have a hearing next Spe Tuesday. Speaking as the head of his legal team, his legal defense <laughs> fund, what, what's up yeah, next? Well, what can you share with well, us? Well, we have, we have uh, well, the charges against my brother were dismissed on May the 7th of this year. Mm -hmm. Should have, the next day, dismissal should have been signed, game over. You know, there's been all kinds of machinations between Judge Sullivan and the appeals court and Sydney trying to fight her way through this. On Tuesday, we have a hearing with Judge Sullivan. We don't really understand why he wants to have a hearing. The Department of Justice and Sidney Powell have both uh, uh, filed motions jointly about saying there's no case or controversy. We don't understand why we're having a hearing. And so it'll be interesting to see. Now also couple that with this explosive exculpatory information that came out yesterday uh, and last night. You know, I don't, I don't actually know what the judge is gonna do. I don't, you know, I don't, we don't know. You know, we, 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 our expectation is that he signs the dismissal. Maybe he wants to talk about some things, ask a few questions, but beyond that, you know, that's what should be done. Will it be done? You know, if, if Judge Sullivan uh, would like to be part of the solution of unifying our country, then he should dis sign the dismissal and move on. If he wants to continue to uh, throw gasoline on a burning fire, um, then, you know, then we'll see. We'll see how he acts. I mean, it's up to him. Last, uh, last question is a prognos prognostication. Who's, who wins the, the race for the White House? Well, I think Donald Trump wins. I think he takes more states than expected. Uh, I think that it'll be an electoral win way bigger than, uh, than 2016. Um, I am very concerned, though, about voter fraud, as the president is. I'm, I'm very concerned that some of these states are allowing, you know, votes to come in two, two weeks, maybe three weeks after, uh, after the deadlines. Um, we'll wait and see what happens. But I think the silent majority in this country, with every new riot that breaks out over nothing, over, over justice being done, like in the case uh, down in Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, Every new riot that breaks out as we head into this election is only going to play into the hands of, of, of Donald Trump's message, which is we need peace, we need security, and we need economic prosperity. Yeah, I think you would. Uh, I think that's one of the things the Democrats are concerned about. That uh, you know their ideology is, oh yeah, burn, destroy, tear down. Then they look at polls right. and they're like, oh, you know, yeah. no, we're all for law and order. Well, you weren't for the first four months. Well, it's it's also interesting too that. <laughs> The mail-in ballots, I guess the, I read something yesterday where the early read on mail-in ballots is that they're heavily favoring Trump. So that would mean there's count, you mean because Republicans have filed them or because there's yes, somebody's opening yes. them up and counting them? Yeah, in North Carolina, they're starting to count them. They're counting them. Yes. Oh my. Oh, so that would explain, yeah. of course, why the all of a sudden the Democrats are like, ah, hold up on that mail-in balloting stuff. That's you know, maybe right. they're not too That's cool right. on that. We're not That's so down right. with that. <laughs> Joe, thank you very, very much for joining us for all of your insights and everything else. God bless you and your family. Please give our regards to your brother. It's uh, horrible what's happened to him, but uh, you know, hopefully if uh, his case is able to shine the light on all of this evil that uh, uh, both uh, in the church and the state, as you say, a massive reform uh, can begin to happen. And uh, you, know, we, well, you know, time will tell, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much for your time. And, and yeah, pray for peace, uh, pray for the president, and um, actually pray for Cardinal Vigano. We, we need more voices like him in the church. Yeah. By the way, he's Archbishop Vigano. <laughs> I'm, sure I'm sure he'll be thrilled you elevated him to the I, I College him, of Cardinals. I gave him an, gave him an upgrade. <laughs>
<laughs> He'll be fine with that. Thanks very much, Joe. God okay, bless thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.